Awesome. Hi, Maria. Hi, Kevin. Okay, I'm going to kind of get started with some preamble. So just for housekeeping, um, feel free to ask your questions directly in the chat. I, I have the chat open. I'm going to take a look. Uh, I'm open to people also coming off mute and saying, hey, I have a question or uh, would like to respond to that. We have a nice small group, so I feel like we can try to make this feel more like a conversation and less that less as a talking at. So don't, do not hesitate to interrupt. It's not an interruption. Um, we also are hoping to put a video of this on our blog to kind of serve as a record of anyone who wants to review what New Harvest has been up to. Uh, it's kind of like an informal uh, video approach to our annual report. So if you have any hesitations about being in the video, you know, turn your camera off, uh, turn your microphone off, um, and maybe keep it that way because we hope to, to share this. Um, with that, I'm going to get things started and show you what we've been up to. So why are we all here on this call today? Uh, we're all here today because we believe that cellular agriculture can unlock a better future. And if you've seen me present before, or New Harvest present before, you've probably seen those three images on the right, uh, or sorry, on the left. Um, we believe that cellular agriculture can create a food system with a, a better sense of public health, create a food system that, that is better for the environment, and hopefully create farming conditions that are better for animals and for the people that work with them. But we also need to shout out what is happening in our climate change world. Um, it is already changed by the climate and agriculture as we know it is shifting rapidly. Uh, so this is a, an image that just shows how much we're going to see changes in agricultural yields and some of the biggest crops that we farm. And the fact is that we need to just diversify and strengthen our food system in order to have a more secure food future. But I think if you follow New Harvest and you're in this call today, I think you're also here because you know that technology is not everything. And so I think you're very familiar that New Harvest does not believe that cellular agriculture is kind of the silver bullet and that technology and what the technology is and how it is created and who creates it and who owns it and how it rolls out into the world is just as important as the actual technical questions themselves. And in fact, those two things are very much interlinked. So with that, I'll introduce New Harvest. We're a global nonprofit organization anchored in the US, Canada, and the Netherlands. And our purpose is to advance cellular agriculture for the public good. Also want to shout out, we turned 20 years old this year. So I'm going to speak a little bit to uh, our 20 years of history. Oh, I have a couple questions. This is great. Uh, I saw one from Katarina. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Katarina, is Stefano there also had a hand up? Uh, I, it was just a mistake, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's a mistake, okay. I will assume the same for Katarina unless they speak up. <laughs> um, also remember you can put the questions directly in the chat. All a right, mistake. let's keep... Okay, no worries. <laughs> let's keep going then. Um, so I was going to share, you know, mission, vision, values, all those things, um, but you can read about that in our strategic plan, which I'll share a little bit later. Um, instead, I wanted to speak to the vision by looking at this awesome piece of speculative fiction that came out recently, just last month in a magazine called Asimov Press, which is a lovely new magazine that is a lot of kind of science writing in there. Um, but the, the piece was about a restaurant that is not, the, that does not exist called pharma. And I'm gonna break some kind of presentation rules by putting long pieces of text in there. So forgive me right now, um, but I hope you all actually read this article. I'll share the links for it soon. Um, but pharma is like us. They believe that the only path towards a food secure future is one in which biotechnological modification becomes the norm. And the chefs at Pharma know that by embracing food technologies such as recombinant DNA, precision fermentation, and cell culture, food can become more nutritious and better for the planet. So I think those of us on the call are probably aligned with this kind of vision. But what I love about this article is they also point out how important it is for the rollout of the technology to go far beyond just the technological questions themselves. 
So they, they go on to say that success of these foods depends on a variety of factors, such as legislation, marketing, data-driven research, taste, and cost, and that sure failure will come from misinformation, which I think is something we're all very concerned about. Uh, let me just go back for a second. So when you when you read this article, it talks about pharma being the point of contact for people interacting with these very biotechnologically modified foods and actually very much celebrating them in the menus and in the, the way the culinary experience is crafted. And I feel like we haven't seen so much of that so far. I think uh, where Luke is based uh, in Boston, I think we do see a couple of restaurants that are really embracing being kind of places where you can only find these, these new foods that have been tried only in this one restaurant. Um, but it shows how much responsibility there is on these kind of creative environments and culinary people and also on eaters in doing all the storytelling related to uh, unroll, like rolling out these techno technologies. Um, but I wanted to parallel that to a paper that I co-wrote in 2014, and I actually had it published one day and 10 years ago. So it was on November 16th, 2014. Um, and if we compare and contrast these things, I think there's a lot of similarities. But what I like about our papers, we also present this kind of restaurant of the future, what the menu looks like, and that's all very exciting. But we unpack what needs to happen in order for that restaurant to happen. So we talk about things that are very familiar at New Harvest. The science has to remain fairly open, transparent, and publicly accessible. We shout out an open source approach to in vitro meat, which will accelerate development of the technology. And we also talk about how heavy prohibitive patent protection early on could stunt this new industry before it has a chance to flourish. And I want to really emphasize that last point because this was written in 2014. The first cultivated meat company was actually not founded until 2015, a year later. And so this idea of you know, seeing so much investment in the private sector and the public sector lagging behind was something that we were calling out early on. Visions for where we can go. I hope they kind of planted your mind as we talk about the actual new harvest is working on this year and into the future. So let's read a little bit more of this highlighted text. Um, so as we develop cellular agriculture, it needs to coincide with a public conversation about meat, meat production, carniculture, which is a, a word we use to describe uh, in vitro cell culture of food, and food science. That science needs to be developed responsibly, driven by discourse from the beginning. Research needs to be funded and conducted publicly. And we need to create a food politic that tackles resource use, the environment, public health, and animal welfare in a cooperative movement. And I think even judging by the people on this call who work in some of these areas, uh, that is something that is unrolling right now. So this last, I promise this is the last of the big tracks of text. Um, this last paragraph, I hope, serves as a kind of vision to inspire us as we go through the rest of this call. Uh, we need to ask how the process of making these cell ag products nourishes human culture and fits in with our sense of a modern humanity. In contrast to industrial farming, meat production methods should go from secretive to celebrated. Meat production facilities go from vast to vertical, and meat production industry moves from the hands of few to the hands of many. And people grow more authentically connected to the origins and creation stories of what they eat. And so when we do calls like these with people like you who work in the field, many of you, I hope that you realize we are living these creation stories right now. Like the creation story of cellular agriculture is happening right now. And talking about it and being on these calls together are how we grow more authentically connected to that work. Great. All right, thank you for uh, entertaining that long you know, extrapolation um, of our vision instead of me just saying our vision is. Um, but I hope it, it inspired you and I also hope that you read those articles in full. It's very cool to compare the kind of two articles 10 years apart and how much similarity there is there. So I'll share those afterwards. So 20 years old, uh, let's do a very I'll try to be quick overview of what we've done in the past 20 years. And if I were to summarize what new harvest activities look like in 20 years, it would be field building. Um, field building is 
is a concept that's actually pretty well known in the nonprofit space, but actually not so well known in the kind of innovation ecosystem space, even though I think they're very much related. Uh, I'll, I'll reference that a little bit later. But when I think about field building, I think about in the early days, we wanted to create this world where we could have food made from cells instead of animals. But we realized that it's not really just about multiplying cells in the lab. It's creating this whole environment where there's investors, entrepreneurs, scientists, academics, uh, eaters, all activated in this in the same goal. So it really is creating a field and creating a movement. Um, so how do you do that when you start from zero? So for the first 10 years of New Harvest, I was not around. Uh, it was founded by a guy named Jason Matheny. And with, with zero full-time staff, with a couple dollars trickling through a PayPal account, um, Jason did a great job getting some momentum going, connecting with researchers in the field, especially in the Netherlands, uh, to kind of get some grants going, really in a, in a supporting role. Um, and so, so things started happening, but the problem was there was very little momentum overall. There wasn't a sense of a zeitgeist or a movement or a community back then. So when I joined the organization, I had to ask myself, okay, we have all these kind of people who are excited about this idea conceptually. So many people who had Googled in vitro meat and thought that they had come up with the idea themselves <laughs> uh, and then found this group. How do we actually activate them to do something of material kind of value that moved the field forward? in the field and how do we do that with zero dollars? So we found that the, the kind of easiest, kind of lowest, lowest hanging fruit way to get any work done, any laboratory work was to actually co-found companies. That was the, the easiest place to find any funding, the easiest place to do any work. So you'll know that New Harvest helped co-found the uh, Perfect Day Foods and the Every Company, so two early companies working on milk proteins and egg proteins in cell culture. And we also supported some other entrepreneurs at the time that were culturing other cool things. Kevin is one of those people on the call who is culturing cool stuff. Um, and we helped them find some you know, just get things going. Feel like there's a zeitgeist. Feel like there's a movement and there's this shift from using cells to grow kind of pharmaceutical products to using them to grow kind of higher volume products like food products. And we found incredible momentum with accelerators and investors at that time who were actually really excited about this idea that we could be producing food in this completely different way. Um, so in those early days, that was great. Things got going. We realized that New Harvest actually didn't have to do a lot to get those things going. Um, instead, we noticed there was a kind of a problem. There was very little technical talent to hire. So these companies would be hiring people kind of from adjacent fields, maybe from the biofuels industry or from pharma. Kind of hard to pull people out of pharma to do these crazy idea startup things. Um, or you were hiring people who didn't have a ton of training and were doing a lot of the training on the job, which is of course very expensive for companies to take on. So our idea back then was, okay, we see these a little bit private sector getting started. How do we activate the actual academic basis of cellular agriculture? How do we create talent pipelines so that high school students can actually enter the field? How do we train people so that by the time they're hired by these cell -like companies, they already know how to grow the right cell types. Um, and there's also this kind of body of knowledge and publications we can refer to on how to actually do this stuff. So not every company is inventing things from scratch independently. So that's what we did. Uh, in 2015, we started to fund open scientific research. We had a few more dollars then. It was still uh, not a lot. And there were lots of people who said, you know, you shouldn't really be funding universities until you have at least, you know, $10 million in the bank. But we knew we would never take a step forward if we waited that long. And who knew, knows if anyone was gonna give us $10 million. So instead we had to figure out how do we get the greatest impact funding research with very small amounts of money. Um, and that was really the design of our research programs and how we supported our grantees. And really it was a focus on supporting great people. Uh, and the project that they did was a little bit secondary. So it was individuals that we felt were really committed to cellular agriculture who were going to fight for cellular agriculture even after um, our support for them ended because they'd have to kind of find their way through grants and proposals and, you know, kind of a difficult environment to keep things going and support those people and see how we can get them to really start the field. 
And by supporting all of those people, we generated a lot of publications in the field as well. And I believe that we really did create the foundations of cellular agriculture as a legitimate field of science in that time period. Natalie is one of those first grantees. Um, she's a great example of those, one of those people who will keep fighting for cell ag despite how hard it is um, in those early days. The problem then was that the field was now upside down. So we had this private sector that was getting a lot more support and this kind of very nascent public sector, which at the time was really only supported by New Harvest, maybe some GFI follow on grants. But this is very early on. So we had to ask ourselves, you know, how can we leverage what's happening in the private sector to support the field at large? And I have to also call out that when you have this imbalanced field, you have an enormous risk of corporate capture. So the companies who can afford to hire people to talk to government are the ones that are steering government, for example. Um, so how do we actually get the siloed information out of private companies and try and create a level playing field so all the new companies that exist together, but also the future companies that need to be founded down the line, have an open path um, when it comes to talking to regulators and policymakers and influencing the future of cellular agriculture from that standpoint. So our idea then was, how can we be an honest broker to get competing companies to actually work together? And the best way to do that was to work on non-competitive issues like safety. So we all know that no one is competing on safety. You all, everyone wants to be good on safety and you want your competitors to be good at safety too because if they do a bad job, it brings down everybody. So uh, it was around 2020, or I, I'll get to that in the next slide, um, that we really started moving forward with this idea of getting people together and unlocking stuff from the private sector. Um, but I do wanna point out that this facilitating work is something that we're going to be doing well into the future, but the supporting of research is something that we continue doing today. We do it in a little bit of a different way um, now, and now I think we're even more focused on what are those neglected pieces of data, evidence, and also those neglected kind of scientific communities, maybe in the agricultural sector, that need to be activated in order to move the field forward. So supporting research is something that we have not stopped. So 2020, let's start leveraging this neutrality that New Harvest has been cultivating for so many years to facilitate that public-private collaboration. We hadn't really seen any groups done that kind of activation before. Um, so the great thing was we published this, this amazing safety paper. We've gone on to engage more and more uh, groups of people to work on these questions and conversations about this. And we realized that as a neutral convener, we could foster conversation that no one else could. So conversations about standards, about real challenges in the ecosystem, about international collaboration, because a lot of grants might foster collaboration in one country or one region, but very hard to get grants that actually connect regions together. Um, and I think most importantly, we build a lot of trust with all of these parties and with regulators and so on by actually being self-critical. So new harvest neutrality is not just in not signing NDAs with companies, but we try to maintain some neutrality and openness to the idea that maybe cellular agriculture is not a good idea. We have to remain open to that being the idea because we don't have the evidence to tell us for absolute sure that is the thing that's going to make the difference. So that self-criticism about where the field is, how it's moving forward, what's missing, what we need to do more of has been enormously important in us putting together these public-private partnerships. Um, the challenge in this work now was a little bit more internal. It required a bit of a shift in messaging. Um, so for many years, when we were very much donor funded, our messaging was about, you know, ending the suffering of factory farming and ending animal agriculture and all the, the kind of bad aspects of it by pre creating this kind of new disruptive approach. Um, but we realized that as we move forward, a shift towards more of a transition language was more important that embraced all the complexities of shifting technologies, but also um, a shift in, maybe this is an and, not an or. Maybe we're not actually replacing huge agricultural systems, but creating new ones that can coexist for a while. So again, more of that transition language. Um, so yeah, our, our, our messaging changed a little bit, and I think that did require a little bit of a identity, questioning our identity during that time. But I think it was also 
for greater impact because then we are starting to work with more government entities and kind of larger amounts of money and bigger partnerships to get things really going forward. So, um, yeah, the, the facilitation is something that we are continuing to do today. And we realize that there's there's no real end in sight to how much work is needs to be done in that space, especially as we see so many new people joining the field that connection of the people across the field is very important and very neglected. I'm gonna pause for a second to see if anyone has any questions. I'm seeing a little bit of chit chat in the chat. Yes, Robert asked, is there any time baked in for Q&A? You can ask the questions just during um, in the chat, and I'll encourage especially the New Harvest uh, staff to pay attention and interrupt me if they see a great question there. I hope we'll have questions at the end. Um, so I'm just going to try and make sure we get through this. Uh, yes, so please do ask questions. Okay, I'll hop back in. So just to summarize what has happened in the past 20 years, we supported 66 researchers who have gone on to have enormous long-term impact as co-founders, as technicians, as technical hires, as academic leaders, as really just important voices in the space representing the kind of technical angles of cellular agriculture. We've also, from that six, those 66 researchers, supported 69 peer-reviewed publications, which is a very big deal because each of those things takes like four years to create. So there was a lot of patience um, and support, long-term support in getting those publications uh, from conception to out the door. But these peer reviewed papers are really what has informed policymakers, grant makers. I know companies read the papers that come out of New Harvest all the time, and have, I, I know they even steer what the companies are up to. Um, and they have spurred a lot of academic discourse, led to winning grants, and so on. So, you know, this is, this is the kind of canon of knowledge for the field and really the foundational kind of first piece of knowledge that was really dedicated to cellular agriculture. Like, yes, you could argue, oh, there was also information you could read from the biomedical space and from biopharma, but these 69 publications were really dedicated to this like question of how to grow food from cells. So I'm incredibly proud of that. And all of you who have contributed to this work or done this work on this call today should be proud of that too. Um, and then of course, there's all these network effects that come from supporting that research and then doing this kind of facilitative work that we do, which is hard to measure and is about getting people in a room. And sometimes the metrics come from two people met in a room that you brought together, stuff like that. Um, but we've facilitated the founding now of at least 15 cell -like companies, um, the founding of at least five institutes of cellular agriculture. And those companies have, and those institutes and those research groups have brought in at least $3 billion in private investment and over $100 million in public investment. And those are metrics that I think will only grow with time. And at least 1,500 jobs have been created in that process as well. So this is true field building is like doing those catalytic activities, um, which are sometimes hard to trace back, uh, but make such a huge difference in terms of getting that momentum zeitgeist field off the ground and making sure that cellular agriculture can live on its own. So um, for those of you who are excited or interested about these concepts of field building, check out this citation at the bottom. It's a, a paper by Bridgespan. It's not actually about tech stuff. It's about field building for kind of not kind of more classical nonprofit movements. But the way this one paper is written is very relevant to what we're all thinking about and working on. So I would encourage you to read that if you're excited about these kind of ecosystem things. Um, and I would say in these past 20 years, what we've always thought about is how do we drive impact long after new harvest intervention has happened? So how do we just spark something and then disappear, but change is still happening? Um, I cannot celebrate any of that work without calling out all of these 66 researchers that we have supported. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell the personal stories of all of them, even though they're all interesting. Um, but these are the 66 people who have really added to the field. And some there are a couple new ones there, too, that are going to continue adding to the field in the years to come. And of course, some of them might be on this call today. Um, so even though I can't tell all of those 66 people's stories, I will tell just one story of ongoing impact. This is from Ricardo at Newcastle University. I'm just going to read this quote out to you. 
The fellowship opened incredible new possibilities, both as a researcher at Newcastle University and as an entrepreneur. It inspired me to make new discoveries that can potentially benefit billions for decades to come. It provided me with the drive to secure multiple collaborative government funding awards, the first drops in what I believe will be a very big ocean of public investment in this space. And it enabled me to found a company offering real value to the global cellular agriculture community today. So what a great story. If you're interested in this company, 3D Biotissues, they do molecular crowding. You can read all about it uh, on their website, but Ricardo is a great example of a researcher who is just gone on to have all this enormous change uh, long after New Harvest supported his work. Okay, now where are we today? Finally, the actual real topic of this year in review call. Um, I'm just gonna revisit the chat. Do we have any questions in the chat, comments? Looks like we're good there. Okay, where are we today in 2024? So here's the New Harvest team. We're seven full-time individuals across three um, different institutions all across the world and one part-time person, Pam. I didn't get in time enough to get her headshot, but she keeps little goats on her farm. So there's one of the little goats. Um, so we are in the Netherlands, we are in the US and we're in Canada doing kind of gently different work in each region, kind of depending on what the region is up to and how the ecosystem works uh, in each of those countries. Um, and a lot of this work is really driven by our directors of responsible research and innovation, Dwayne, Bree, and Jadira, who, who focus their work in the different regions. So Dwayne in the Netherlands, Bree in the US, and Jadira in Canada. Um, and then Paige, Simon, myself, and Britt try and support all of these big grant proposals that the three of them are working on, these big projects they are working on um, through fundraising, through admin, through general operations, through uh, fun, uh, fundraising and finance side of things, and also through facilitating some of those kind of conversations with stakeholders, donors, government, and so on. So we're a very lean team, but I also think that that smallness allows us to be very flexible and thus very impactful. So we're, we're not weighed down by org charts. Uh, everyone's quite independent in what they do. Um, and I think it allows us to move quite quickly. And then of course, because there's so few of us, we make the most of a donor dollars along the way. So very quickly, we did craft a new strategic plan for 2025, which is slightly different than the one from the, the few years before that. Um, we do have a link for how you can review the strategic plan. We're open to some public feedback right now. Again, we landed on a, a purpose. So before we had missions and our missions would change kind of often because of the field building activity. So the field building activity had our mission kind of changing. We realized, you know, let's actually zoom out and look at what is New Harvest really trying to do in the bigger, bigger picture. So our purpose is cellular agriculture for the public good. So real emphasis on that public good piece because I think it's something that really needs to be advocated for in a very private sector. And our focus is uh, advancing responsible research and innovation in cellular agriculture through facilitative leadership. So highlighting the facilitative leadership, which we've spoken to a little bit already, getting people together, doing our best to kind of um, steer conversations in a certain way or have conversations that aren't being had but are very important. And then a, another focus on the responsible research and innovation. So there's lots of tech development that happens but how do we do it responsibly? How do we ask some of those questions that are not being asked? How do we engage partners that maybe haven't been engaged yet? That responsible angle to the, the R&D is very important to us. And then the strategies are again, building off of what we've learned over the past 20 years. We wanna keep facilitating that collaborative open research. So assembling these big public private research initiatives that still support researchers but maybe in a little bit different way than we have been doing it before, but then focus on creating that open, credible, unbiased information that's going to guide the field going forward. And then the second strategy is a little bit different, but it's facilitating mission-driven field alignment. So there's a lot of facilitating that happens maybe um, that doesn't necessarily have to be mission-driven. So an example could be an industry organization, like an industry organization is focus on alignment, but they might be focused on alignment 
for the benefit of just their industry or the, or the members of that industry. For us, mission-driven fields alignment could very well include industry, but it's steering things in a certain way that focus on that, that public good angle. So for us, that means develop, uh, developing standards, guidelines, pledges, certifications, these different kind of alignment tools that gets us to create a field that is more accountable and keeps us on mission. Because we have to remember the environmental outputs that we want, you know, things that are better for the environment, better for animals, better for public health. Those are not really incentivized um, unless you create the incentives for it. So this is something that we really think is very important in these next five years. So I'm just going to now review a whole bunch of projects that we're working on. Um, the little flag, so I have a little uh, US flag and a world there. That's just to show the scope of the project kind of. So this cultured meat safety initiative that we're working on is kind of centered more in the US, but it is international in scope because we work with people from all around the world. And this is a continuation of that project that started in 2020. It's an ongoing initiative to keep engaging people around safety. Um, it's in partnership with Viru Advisors. They've been instrumental in doing this work. We, I mean, it's just impossible to do it without them. Um, and since we started this in 2020, we've now engaged over 90 industry leaders, over 50 governmental scientists and regulators, over 10 academic scientists, and put out two peer-reviewed publications that we know are very well read uh, by the policy maker and regulator community. And we have three more events coming up. So if any of you on this call are interested in participating in those safety conversations, um, I'll share some links for that later and get in touch with Bree. And Bree is on the call. So Bree, maybe if you wanna share a little uh, call to action in the chat, um, we'll get people focused on that. So that's the safety initiative. Um, a next cool project that's getting started in Canada is omics guided technologies for the production of cultivated meat. So omics genomic, proteomic, metabolomic approaches to addressing some of the technical, economic, and even social barriers to scaling and commercialization of cultivated meat. We're excited about this because I think this is the first technical grant in Canada, Shadira, maybe you can correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, um, that is bringing together five academic and nine industrial partners to start tackling uh, cultivated meat in Canada. Uh, we also co-designed a new award with a foundation called the Cully Carlson Foundation. Um, so this award was designed um, with them to try and figure out how do we actually get people like educated folks that are already in an advanced degree to kind of shift towards cellular agriculture at the end, which is something we saw happen really well with a, a former award we had called the dissertation award. Um, so it's kind of shifting people who have professional experience and aligning their existing uh, experience into cellular agriculture. Um, we haven't announced this yet, but we, we have onboarded two new researchers uh, with this award. So you'll see this as an update in the newsletter coming soon. So Andre and Omo Wanmi are going to be joining us in doing some research on microbial based scaffolds and agricultural economics in cellular agriculture. Uh, I know some of you on the call are part of this big project. So this is feasts happening in the Netherlands, but also international in scope across 16 countries, in fact. Um, so this is a, a huge, huge project of which Dwayne Holmes, our uh, director of responsible research and innovation in the Netherlands, is the executive director of this giant project. Um, and it's really about creating, again, this kind of basis of unbiased knowledge to inform um, people from a neutral standpoint on how cultured meat and seafood actually works. So I, you should check out this website, feast-innovation.eu to kind of get the full rundown of this huge project. I think it's a 7 million euro project. So it's, a, it's quite intense over several years, um, but I'll just read out some of the work packages involved. A mission-driven roadmap, uh, data-driven sustainability by design, multi-stakeholder engagement for socioeconomic and ethical considerations, food safety, nutrition and regulatory assessment, multi-dimensional impact assessment, and maximizing impact through communications and open science. Um, so if you're a deep, deep fan of New Harvest, you probably have read our Race to Mission 
uh, paper, this project was very much inspired by that race to mission paper, of which Duane was a big part as well. Next, uh, we have been pushing forward artificial in intelligence in cellular agriculture with the support of Amy, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, and Schmidt Futures for a couple of years now, a little bit over a year now. Um, this is work that Bree has been leading. It's support from the U.S., but also in Canada, so a nice uh, collaborative project there. Um, as far as I understand, this was kind of the first AI and in cell ag project of its kind that really talked about AI in the open. We know a lot of companies said that they were using AI, but kind of, you know, didn't always know what that looked like exactly. So this paper that recently came out just a couple weeks, maybe a month ago, um, looks at all the opportunities to ap apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to cellular agriculture to solve some of the kind of open-ended questions in cellular agriculture. And we are now supporting a full-time uh, researcher for the next year to kind of dig into some aspects of that, which in this case is machine-driven machine -driven optimization of cell culture media for cellular agriculture that will be done by Ali. So we'll be making an announcement about this in our newsletter soon as well. You can ask in the chat, Bree has been leading this work. Okay, another great project in Canada. I wonder why I didn't sort the projects by region. I don't know. But um, this one is very much focused on environment, scale up, safety, nutrition, and food processing. What's exciting about this project is that it's led by the governmental scientists at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So this is a, a government agency that is focused, that is filled with a lot of technical uh, experts that are focused on agricultural uh, questions and agriculture in Canada. And so we're so excited to see this like government funded, but also executed by government uh, employee uh, project. Um, it's going to be leveraging provincial and national expertise, as well as working with academia, small and medium enterprises, so companies and nonprofit organizations to foster transdisciplinarity and develop open research to diversify our food sources. Um, so we're going to have two uh, PhD students and one master student join the New Harvest Fellowship in this process. So we're very excited about that. Um, I also wanted to add, I don't know, I should have had this link handy, but we are very excited to see that the government of Canada actually has a definition of cellular agriculture on their website now. So. Uh, Shadira has been making great progress engaging all of these various government entities at the federal and provincial levels and really getting cellular agriculture on the map. And cellular agriculture is actually even called out in AAFC, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's um, uh, report. The science. Yes, thank you, Shadira. So it's actually strategic plan. So it's so exciting to see our field find kind of new levels of legitimacy by being built into some of these big strategic plans. Thank you, Shadira. All right, another great Canadian project. This one is now focused on canola meal. So looking at an existing agricultural stream and side stream um, and using that for cellular agriculture. So this is funded by a whole bunch of different government entities and working with some partners that I think might be new to the cell ag space, like the Canola Council. Um, and so we're gonna be bringing together five partner organizations. This is really led by Queen's University. and We're part of the, the proposal. Um, and yeah, we're going to be looking at canola meal as a potential scaffolding material for cellular agriculture applications. And we will be getting one more PhD student to join the fellowship in the process. So EU Biofutures, another project happening in uh, the Netherlands and across Europe. This one's bringing together 10 partners that will build recommendations and initiatives to foster entrepreneurship and secure EU leadership in deep food biotech. Um, so the recommendations and initiatives here, you know, this is really focused on designing some policy or inf uh, informing some policy. So we're really excited about that. Um, and it's going to be creating some actions and recommendations. And very importantly, it's one of those, again, across many countries partnerships that we're really excited to be part of. Um, we have been sharing updates about our Institute 
at the University of Alberta, which has been an ongoing project for a couple of years now. Um, we finally hired a, a new professor, assistant professor Ning Zhang, who is who just started last month, two months ago. Um, and we have a soon to be announced update coming soon for the Institute. But it has been great working with this first professor and kind of activating this space for cellular agriculture. Um, if you've been following this story for a while, we just feel like the University of Alberta is so well suited for cellular agriculture because it has cell culture facilities in the same place as food science facilities. Um, you know, there's a meat slicer in one room and you go to another room and there's like a 10 or maybe 1000 liter bioreactor tank. So it really kind of brings together all this kind of equipment and expertise under one roof, very well focused on cellular agriculture. Um, and also kind of cool thing, the room in this facility that would be focused on cellular agriculture was once owned by the beef producers. So right above the door, it says, you know, beef producers room. So yes, the future of beef is happening uh, at this institute. Oh, and also thank you to all the people who helped us select, like it was kind of unusual to do a selection process that was so public. Uh, so thank you to all the people who provided input and kind of were, was part of that process as we shared it in our newsletter. Now, this was kind of our second big thing, which is something we've only kind of unrolled in the past few months. Um, so facilitating mission-driven field alignment, as I mentioned, this is how do we get people aligned to keep cellular agriculture on mission? So we had a kind of early event in Boston just to kind of test out how things were feeling. How, how does it work to actually run an event like this? How does it work to get people talking about mission uh, solely in cellular agriculture, and being open to kind of the compromises of mission versus kind of market focused approach. Um, so I think where this goes is just a lot more engagements with people, a lot more kind of invite only conversations, small group conversations, because they have to be quite deep conversations um, to talk about how to keep things on mission. Um, so we had a round table in Edmonton recently with a whole bunch of people that we felt were really excited about these ideas of standards and mission alignment. Um, and we started to work on what we felt was an ecosystem to do list. So things that the whole ecosystem have yet to do that could really move the field forward in terms of impact. And we are going to be publishing the proceedings from that workshop quite soon. So that is in progress. Um, on a similar lines, um, Shadira has been doing amazing work with Cellular Agriculture Canada, uh, even before New Harvest existed. Um, and we're talking a lot about how to create alignment in these kind of regional uh, areas. So the work that we've been doing in Canada is very much focused on Canada and, and in line with the proposals and things that Jadira is putting together. But a uh, very cool thing is we also invited some international cell ag leaders from other groups like cell ag Brazil, cell ag Portugal to observe because even though each region is different and they really should be run by regional leaders, I think there's some kind of sharing of practices that can happen between the different regions of how to move things forward. Um, in terms of methodology. So things will keep going on this. I think we'll have more updates on it next year as we do more and more of these engagements. So um, there's a lot of things that we have not announced yet. So um, stay tuned in the, in the next few weeks of New Harvest newsletters, you'll hear about seven new publications that have come out that have not yet been announced. Um, we are going to be in a, just a couple hours after this call, um, putting out a call for 10 researchers to help us build a new fellowship for New Harvest called the D-Risk Food Fellowship. D-Risk is an acronym for Defining, Enhancing, and Refining Agricultural Inputs and the Supply Chains of Cellular Agriculture and Biomanufacturing of Food. Big mouthful. What it is in short is how do we connect cellular agriculture to agriculture agriculture? So how do we get things that are grown in the ground to actually feed into some of these biomanufacturing processes? Because we so far have really talked about cell ag as a field in top down way. So what happens in the laboratory, but the real impact happens when we connect what happens in the laboratory all the way back to seeds planted in the ground, turning into inputs that are then going into these bioreactors. Um, so very excited about that new fellowship. Um, we'll also be doing a couple new hires one in the Netherlands and one in Canada. So if you're looking for a job, keep an eye out in the newsletter. And we are fairly certain that we're gonna get good news for a couple uh, consortium grants in a couple weeks. So stay tuned on that too. 
Now, I didn't want to give a presentation that was all good news because I don't like it when I see other presentations that are all good news. So in reviewing the year, it's like, hey, what are the real challenges that New Harvest has been facing? So these are six of the biggest challenges that I think we've been experiencing over the past year. Um, number one, we have zero comms team. So, you know, even in this past call, we talked about all the unannounced things that we have coming. So keeping our community updated on our impact is a bit of a challenge. Fundraising remains pretty interpersonal and like person to person relationships because we just don't have that comms team to do the, the massive outreach um, that we did before. And also was not something that we deeply, deeply emphasized before. So uh, yeah, New Harvest is very much an intimate community, which I think you can feel on this call. Um, the good thing is, you know, that your support, uh, goes directly to the impactful work of our research directors and, uh, those of us that support the research, research directors. So that's the, the pro side of that. Um, the other thing is we have a very small team, which means, and we're across three different countries. So we're, we're separated and it means that independence and entrepreneurship and independent leadership is, is really a must. So, um, even though I get to be the one to share these calls and they be on the talks and everything. Um, Jadira, Bree, and Dwayne are all leaders in their own right, in their own regions. Um, they're the ones manning the conversations where they are. And I would go so far as to say that all the team that supports them, Paige, Simon, myself, Britt, and Pam are also quite independent in how we support people in three different countries at the same time. Um, another huge challenge is balancing that fundraising and I guess the comms between donors and government. So I've mentioned this a little bit earlier. The way we talk about cellular agriculture to move a donor to donate is different than the way we move a government to care. Um, there are a couple overlaps there, but of course governments want to hear about jobs being created and how their economy is going to be diversified and how we're going to drive the uh, startups to move there and hire people and all that kind of stuff. And so sometimes it can, it can feel a little bit uh, interesting just living at this intersection of two messages that sometimes align but sometimes feel a little bit in conflict and i think a great example of that is is salag an and or an or so is salag meant to replace agriculture as we know it or is it actually adding on to agriculture as we know it and i think the answer is actually a little bit of both um, because we want this idea of like a greater transition um, but happy to hear reflections on that as well um, I also need to shout out that it just still isn't an easy time for Salag out there. I think for the founders on this call and the people who work in the private sector, it isn't an easy time to raise money. It isn't an easy time to advocate for cellular agriculture, given some of the news that is existing out there. Um, so that, that has been a challenge, but I'll also say, and you can come at me if you, if you are mad or whatever, but I don't think companies have really changed their tune despite being in this tough position. I thought that, having a kind of harder time raising money would force a little bit more collaboration and make more companies feel like, hey, if we band together, our sustainability is a little bit more secured. I haven't seen a ton of that happen just yet. So I would like to see some companies really emerge um, with that as their kind of calling card or their, their differentiation. So let's see if that happens more in 2025. And then, Second to last, we've seen so much academic support in cellular agriculture this year. I mean, the Bezo centers, all the work that's happening at some of the existing centers that have been receiving government grants. Um, it's been awesome to see so much academic uh, fire in the cellular agriculture space. So that's awesome. Um, that has really given space for New Harvest to focus on what is really, really neglected and what are the things, what are the tiny gaps that we need to fill that make the most of all of the stuff that's happening out there in academia. And you can come at me about this statement as well, but I think that, you know, the way our field started with companies being quite siloed, kind of doing their own thing in their own corner of the world, I'm a little bit worried that we might replicate that in academia because we have a lot of these academic institutions coming out, but we don't really see how the academic institutions are connecting with one another or where one really excels and others focus on certain areas, like or some focus on training or some focus on the ag side or some focus on the biomedical side or some focus on the scaffold side. So 
I would hope that in this next year, especially with our facilitative work, we can help getting help get some of these academics rowing in the same direction and seeing a shared vision for how they all collaborate with one another. Um, and then last but not least, this is maybe a I don't I actually am curious if this is a new idea or not. Um, but in certain circles, we've been talking about a protein transition as a as an idea as big as the energy transition. So we're familiar with the energy transition. It's moving away from fossil fuels um, towards more renewables, but realizing that that requires a lot of diverse um, technologies. We also realize it's very complicated. Jobs are shifting, economies are shifting, where the business happens is shifting. Um, if we want to shift agriculture or do a protein transition with where we look at animal agriculture as fossil fuels and something that we need to divest from a little bit or diversify from by creating new ways of producing food along the way, we really should be applying that energy transition mindset to that because it's just as complicated, it's just as big. It's arguably bigger because it's like so mandatory. Um, but this, this kind of big idea is still very underdeveloped in the world. And I think climate is still really slow to pick up on how much ag is part of the climate conversation. Um, so I hope that we see more and more of this kind of conversation emerging. I don't think it's just New Harvest that can lead this conversation. I think we can be part of it, but I hope we see more movement from the nonprofit sector, from the academic sector in this space. Um, if someone is feeling very activated right now, there is no Wikipedia page for protein transition. There's tons of citations, tons of articles, nonprofit articles, um, academic articles spelling out what a protein transition is, how it works, why it's complicated, but there's no Wikipedia page. So maybe that's a very interesting link in the chain of publicizing this big idea. Okay, some very, very last reflections. This is my second last slide. Um, so when I add up all of those things from all of those other slides, um, soon we will be bringing on two new teammates. 17 new researchers, which is a real reinvigoration of a New Harvest research program, and sharing seven new publications. So that is huge growth from where we were last year and the year before. So thank you everyone for making that happen, especially our research directors for putting together such great projects to bring all of those people into New Harvest. Um, we're also seeing that government support picking up, which is a, a big shift that we made a couple of years ago. Um, it's just awesome to engage with government. Marion, who's on the call, has been really helping us engage with government, especially in Canada, so thank you for that. Um, protecting New Harvest neutrality over all these years has been so critical to that. Maintaining a consistent vision that has not changed has also been critical to our credibility. I think those those uh, two speculative fictions show, show that very well. And just being 20 years old also sh uh, shows a lot of credibility. We've stuck to this conversation for so long. Um, and I think it shows just how long term this project is. So lots has happened in the past 20 years. I'm very, very excited for what the next 20 years holds. And very last, but absolutely not least, the reason that we can do all of this work is because of our visionary donors. They drive the impact that we have. Even though we're getting this government support and launching these new projects, it's our ability to connect these projects together. That is not funded by government. That is funded by all of you. Um, that flexibility to look at new projects, the flexibility to explore new areas and talk to new people, um, that's thanks to donors. And so our agility in this like rapidly changing environment uh, keeps our work very fresh and relevant and impactful. And we know that we're not a very loud organization or a very big organization, but we're incredibly catalytic. And I think that it's very safe to say we set a narrative and we set a tone for the field. Sometimes we're so early that people don't like what we always have to say. Um, but I think we can do that because of our donor support that keeps us so independent. So with that, I have to do the mandatory. Thank you so much. And please consider a donation. Um, Giving Tuesday in the, the fundraising season is well upon us. Um, the link at the bottom is the best way to make a contribution. Um, we've already raised almost $800,000 and we need to raise another $500,000 for us to keep going with the work that we have planned for the next year. And I'll just end off with this quote from Cameron. Then we can hop into some Q&A. Uh, so Cameron is one of the researchers that we supported and he actually also became a professor very recently uh, doing cellular agriculture work and 
uh, working with us very collaboratively. So he, here, Cameron says, New Harvest is a visionary org that has been ahead of the curve in many aspects of CELAG. Their track record speaks for itself, and I can think of no better organization to support if your goal is advancing the field in an equitable